Uh, and thank you everyone for attending uh, NAFAM's Engineering Data Science Working Group panel titled Current and Engineering ML Techniques for Engineering. Uh, ML techniques for engineering applications. So engineering data science working group is formed just last year in April 2021 to advocate the use of data science, including machine learning, AI and optimization to improve product design process and design decisions. We aim to provide guidance in the use of data science by sharing experiences, following the developments in this field and promoting best practices. There are currently 14 members from different industries and backgrounds, and Engineering Data Science Working Group Chair is Ledebur Balabono from Boeing, and I'm honored to be the co-chair. So before we start the panel, as a newly formed group, as we are building the NAFAM's Engineering Data Science Community, I would like to invite you to join to the community by going to the NAFAM's website and under community technical groups, you can find the engineering data science site. All right, so this is the third panel the engineering data science working group have organized in the past, um, I would say six months. The first panel was titled AI ML in engineering design, its status and readiness for it. The second panel was titled today's opportunities and challenges of data science in engineering. As you can see from the progression of the titles, we are starting the discussions at a very high level and approaching to the daily applications of data science in, this, in engineering with this third panel. So during this event, NAFAM's event, we've heard many uh, presentations that are using newer ML techniques to solve a variety of engineering applications. We've heard about GANs, PINs, transfer learning, reinforcement learning, anomaly detection, geometric machine learning, computer vision, and many other topics. And as this is a fast growing and changing field and everyone is very passionate about their work, um, it becomes a bit more of a challenge for the audience to separate what is available today, what can be done today, versus what's gonna be available in the near future, versus what is still a little bit of a science fiction. So this panel um, will be discussing exactly that topic um of what each of the panelists are using today to solve problems what they're working towards um to overcome some of the challenges that today's um, techniques have and in the next 60 minutes so i'll start with introducing the the panelists and and continue with asking the panel questions and finally we'll start taking questions from the q a box so please write your questions as the panel continues um as we're wrapping up the panel questions i'll start taking the questions um from the audience all right so let me start uh the panel with a brief introduction of each panelist today we have with us alex carl who is an associate fellow in robust design and systems engineering in Rolls Royce, and he is an engineering data science working group member. Uh, we have um, Dr. Moritz Frenzel, who is in um, BMW Structural Optimization Competence Center and also an engineering data science working group member. We have Astrid Wall, who is the founder for Safety Solutions and a recent addition to the engineering data science working group. And Remy Duquette, um, who is the vice president in industrial AI at Maya HTT, and also a recent addition to the engineering data science working group. And finally, we have Levant Brock-Kara, who is a professor of mechanical engineer at Carnegie Mellon University. All right, with that, I would like to start uh, with, uh, let's say, Alex. And Alex, and uh, if you if you can talk to your background very briefly and how you started working in the field of engineering data science. Uh, we've seen many questions from um, the audience in terms of how um, they can get knowledge about data science in respect to engineering applications and how they can grow themselves in this field, upskill themselves. So I think that will be very useful if you can all talk to your backgrounds and how you started um, to work in this field. Okay, thanks Fatma for that very nice introduction and just a little words about my background. I'm 24 years or maybe 25 years with Rolls Royce now. And background is thermal mechanical analysis, but working in the recent years a lot in the data science area, data analytics. 
as you probably know, we get a lot of data from our engines and servers, and we need to analyze that data. That's where data science tools come to, to play. And we're also looking in areas like where we can see, but like doing physics informed data analytics, so where we can fuse the machine learning with the physical understanding we already have and the models there. And we're developing tools and methods in that area. So there's still a lot to do on that area. So we are at the moment, I would say, doing basic analysis of the data and trend analysis and these kind of things. And we are planning, as I said, to link that up with all our simulation understanding in the longer term. So that's, I think, where it's going from the methods type. That's me for the moment. Thanks, Alex. Astrid, would you like to follow? Yes, sure. So um, also hello to everyone from my side. And um, yeah, so about my background. So I'm a mechanical engineer by heart and um, have a PhD in computational engineering. Mm -hmm. And so most of my industrial um, or most of most of my uh, time in industry, I spend in R&D, mainly optimizing turbine blades um, in Siemens energy. And but then I have moved towards um, data science and actually like um, one one of my first positions there was also with Rolls Royce. So managing time series data, but I kind of felt the need that I also wanted to really do data science, especially with regards to simulation. And that was also one reason why I then um, started my own company. And now I'm really all in on my mission to bringing data science and simulation closer to each other. And um, so actually, I think for my day-to-day um, -day work, so what, what is really like, what, what am I working on actually like all the time? It's a lot of bringing data management and also um, spending time at front on data modeling, bringing this closer to everyone because the, these are just like the foundations everyone needs to do also with regards to doing some other fancy stuff. Thanks, Astrid. Um, I'll go in the alphabetical order. So, um, Levant, would you like to continue? Sure. Uh, thank you for having us uh, for this panel. Uh, and my name is Barack. Um, I received my undergraduate education from the Middle East Technical University in Ankara in mechanical engineering. And uh, it was a very traditional mechanical engineering instruction and, and education. And since then, for my PhD, uh, I was working on an intersection between AI, natural human interfaces, and, and engineering uh, analysis. So that brought us to my, my initial contact with machine learning, where we were trying to understand humans, basically, how they express their thoughts in sketches on a computer, where human-to-human -human dialogue is very fluid, but uh, computers had a hard time understanding what was being, being portrayed. So we developed quite a bit of machine learning uh, ideas for computers to interpret human drawn sketches. And that led to me to more CAD 3D modeling um, projects in which uh, we were working with car companies and for the early design stages, they were sketching out a lot of concepts and uh, you know they were taking that and then once they settle on an idea, they would try to go into the computer and then realize that uh, using the CAD tools. And we were developing new 3D sketch-based um, construction uh, methodologies where humans would not actually deal with the control points, but rather simply sketch on a 3D environment. So that led us to creating even more machine learning algorithms to understand human intentions. So that led to my more recent work projects in additive manufacturing, uh, three-dimensional design using um, repositories of, of past data, uh, car data, automotive data, air, airplane data, for instance, being able to learn from past designs in order to inform future designs. And right now we're doing a lot of interesting work in electronics design automation, uh, using reinforcement learning, combining design and manufacturing, as well as process control for hydrogen fuel cells, as well as additive manufacturing. Thank you so much. Moritz? Hello, everyone. Good evening for the European uh, community here. Um, yeah, my name is Moritz Frenzel. Thanks for, for having me here. Um, coming to the background, I think uh, it's similar to all the, the other colleagues. I also started in computation mechanics, uh, did a PhD with the 
like kind of root cause finite element simulation, programming finite element codes, working with matrices, uh, huge ones and all that kind of stuff. Um, then actually I also did spend uh, five years in the aero industry um, where, yeah, as well, again, simulation plays a big role. I'm, I was still fond of simulating whatever possible, you know, multi-physics, multi-scale things. Uh, all back with uh, with our nice finite element modeling. Um, then moving on actually to into the automotive uh, world, um, where I've been working, you know, about eight years, I think, starting in early design stages, and then um, always asking myself why why is simulation not huge in automotive, uh, and then learning or recognizing that it's just not not fast enough. So um, automotive world, I think is, is just, yeah, larger, more people, not that many experts in the simulation field. So uh, from year to year now still working with, you know, crash and, and, and stiffness design of the body, I kind of believe that um, our field might be disrupted from uh, the, the even larger field of um, yeah, machine learning, which in the end is also just playing with the matrices and, and, and bringing some pipelines of algorithms uh, next to each other. Um, but then, yeah, having just a, a much larger larger group of uh, yeah, potential experts or even algorithms uh, um, replacing the, the expertise. And this this challenge at, at, BIM, at my, my company where you know, we, we also, we're keen in design processes, which is not at all computational, uh, but also with physics uh, processes, very, very detailed ones. Um, I'm, I'm curious on the upcoming years, how this challenge uh, is going on and being a still a tech player, but also with some roots in, in historic expertise in mechanical engineering or even with data. I, I wonder uh, where these upcoming five to 10 years lead us. Yeah, I think we all share the same uh, same questions and curiosity. Um, all right, Remy, would you like to uh, introduce? Sure, thank you, uh, Fatma, for having me here on, on the panel. I'm, uh, as uh, Fatma mentioned, Remy Duquet, uh, Vice President of Industrial AI at Maya. Uh, but um, joining the group. I'm one of the newer member of, of the uh, engineering data science group uh, with Astrid uh, that we joined together recently. And uh, I'm glad to participate here. My background, uh, so as everybody else here, mechanical engineering uh, by training initially, and then graduate studies in aerospace engineering, then went on to put five satellites in orbit. Um, and the latest one was perhaps what I call now the, the farthest edge device I've ever worked on, which is roaming on, on Mars uh, these days and, and sending telemetry. So where we talk about data and latency and all that sort of telemetry um, uh, challenges we might have with data, this is kind of an extreme case of it. Uh, but in any case, so that's my background. And, and after that, and that was about 10 years ago when, when I worked on those, those projects, I realized that the telemetry that we were getting uh, could be leveraged in better ways. And that was kind of the, the pivoting point around 2010 when GPU uh, enabled a lot of machine learning and things to become practical, right, in terms of applications that we could leverage. Um, and so based on that kind of, I guess, um, leap of 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 luck um i combine my my love with uh, engineering and data science and moved us into uh industrial ai uh, and combining physics based understanding with real-time telemetry data and, and other data over time so that's me Thank yeah. Thanks, Remy. I think it will be very fair to say that from this panel, we see how important the domain expertise is uh, in applying data science for engineering. So if there are any junior engineers out there that are looking into getting into data science, um, I think one advice would be to develop a domain expertise as well as, um, as learning um, data science. All right, so um, I would like to start the panel from um, a, you know, discussing some of the current applications of ML AI and how these applications um, differentiate themselves from others, um, so that so that they're good candidates for ML AI applications. And so, I'd like to start with Burak. Um, can you give some examples of where you have applied data-driven models to solve 
your engineering uh, problems and how, what were the characteristics of these applications such that um, they were very suitable for um, these methods? Right. Um, I think it's very easy for all of us to test our initial ideas on classical problems for which there are really good solutions and solvers out there. But I think the, the, the key value is can we identify problems in which ML truly shines over classical techniques? And uh, we have been involved in several projects. And um, what I can, I think, summarize out of all my ex experiences and exposure to all of these projects is that Anytime you need real-time performance, this could be real-time process monitoring where you need like a second level um, prediction out of, a, out of a computer to make decisions, or when you have combinatorial optimization cases in which you know, existing state-of-the-art solutions are still heuristic driven. In those particular scenarios, I think ML can truly shine. And in some of the example projects that we have covered, um, we are looking at, for instance, real-time monitoring of the additive manufacturing process for laser powder bed fusion. You can imagine that this is a very slow process, can take up to days, for instance, and you cannot have an operator, for instance, constantly observe what's going on in the build chamber. But we're now inserting uh, acoustic sensors that can actually listen to the build chamber. And as soon as something is going bad, a flaw formation is happening, the system can automatically detect that and, and throw a flag. So it's you, a human ear can actually listen and understand and differentiate in the, in the acoustic signals, but it's very difficult for a computer to do this. So we train a system that can do this in an offline setting with a lot of data that we generate through real builds. We train a machine learning system and when it's deployed, it can with very high accuracy, very quickly detect when things are going bad. Another similar example is in our, uh, our project in hydrogen fuel cells, where there's uh, the concept of nitrogen buildup that needs, needs to be purged out of the fuel cell. And nitrogen, as you can imagine, is an inert gas, so it's very expensive to create sensors that, I can, that can actually detect nitrogen buildup. So we are, and the computational models for these are very, very expensive, imagining very deep stack fuel cells, hundreds of layers, for instance, the computational models simply don't work. So we are we have been collecting data and understanding how the nitrogen buildup is related to other indicators like temperature, humidity, and other types of signals. And we do um, a, a dynamic LSTM type of type of an approach to very accurately and very quickly detect when nitrogen is exceeding uh, a, a threshold level, and then that can be automated. So um, these are, I think, very interesting applications. Um, and the combinatorial optimization case comes in electronics design automation, for instance, where uh, when you're doing circuit routing, imagine very complex integrated circuits where there are millions of little pins and they need to be connected. You need to put metal um, you know, connectors. So this is a very difficult problem, especially if you're trying to minimize congestion or the, the traffic buildup in, in, on the board. And the solutions are all heuristic based. Basically, A star search apply to tons of different uh, pairs. Um, and we're now seeing that using reinforcement learning, DQN networks, for instance, we can actually outperform the classical method. So this gives us very, um, you know, we're cautiously optimistic that ML type of approaches will actually supersede uh, what human designers are tending to do with heuristics or simple optimization-based approaches. So we are very excited about the prospects of these. Thank you for those examples. So if I'm not mistaken, most of these examples actually uh, work with um, sensor data, which is more available than simulation data. Uh, and or um, the number of design, the amount, the design space is so large that it's it's uh, it's impossible to be able to explore the entire design space without using a machine learning algorithm like reinforcement learning that learns faster. Exactly. So the arguments are either the speed argument, real time speed argument, where you can actually afford to train in an offline setting through simulations or real data. So the offline can be expensive, but the real time performance is very high or the problem itself is very complex, which is bordering the combinatorial optimization cases. Yes.
All right. Thanks. Thanks, Brad. What about you, Remy? Uh, you worked in a variety of applications. What are some of the, the successful um, applications where you use data driven uh, methods such as ML AI? Uh, and what were their characteristics to make them a good candidate for these methods? Well, I'll spring maybe on on yeah those uh, comments here on you know the, the there's definitely uh, more real time telemetry data available than, than than simulation data in some cases right and and so what we've seen and I've heard in the last you know two days here some interesting approaches uh, you know since yesterday combining the the, the physics based reduce order modeling and data driven kind of approaches for very specific in uh, engineering and and operations cases whether it's for uh, preventive maintenance type thing or end of life type of components as we've seen in the previous pre presentation even uh, from Xerox that that was a great uh, showcase of of what is practical today and and when we you know bring time series type of, of data that's collected from from real sensors um, in the past we we've used them mostly from you know testing very like uh, I'm going to call them controlled environments so we and we still have that option to generate some data uh, from from some of the designs or early conceptual uh, designs when it when it's possible and and should be continue uh, continue to be used but now we also have with the advent of, of edge computing over the last decade and and all the cloud infrastructure that's there to collect that data maybe not in real time but in near real time in any way in time series type of, of of data we we do get access to a lot more data as an from an engineering group to f get feedback from those real use cases now it's from you know non-standard non-controlled environments so that there is some <laughs> some interesting uh, caveats there from the data side uh and things to and pitfalls to avoid uh, uh, and and cer certainly a lot of learning there but uh, what I've seen as a lot of applications right now, uh, at least in the last couple of years uh, that are, are being deployed in real operational environment is those reduce order models, right? So either, you know, getting data, real time telemetry data and feeding it to your engineering model to make them better and validate them and correlate them in the first place, but then reduce them, you know, from a data driven perspective and instead of just purely relying on, on the physics based approaches to reduce those data driven approach from the the data collected to enhance the, the the process and engineering. We talked about reinforcement learning. Uh, learning that's one kind of a nice uh, way of, of reusing and leveraging a lot of the telemetry data. Certainly, because you know reinforcement learning with simulation data would be really tough because you need a lot of it to make it work. Uh, but from you know from the time series type of data, you can uh, use and build some uh, very sophisticated reduce order models uh, and and feed them into a reinforcement learning approach for, for control purposes so those kinds of combinations I've seen on a practical basis being very uh, successful and I think we're gonna see a lot more of, of that going on but again the the, the data is, that we collect we have tons of it the, the focus is turning at least in the last three or, or years that I've been in this uh, you know decade of, of ramping up on, on deep learning and machine learning I think the focus is now shifted from quantity of data to quality of data that we feed to those models and how we feed them so whether it's clustering and outlier detection we hear a lot more of those kinds of techniques being deployed uh, to help engineer do a better job thank you um I I'm hoping to see maybe uh, Astrid can wrap up um, this conversation to see, you know, what is the, the benefit of um, data driven processes and data skilled people in uh, for the companies and maybe give us an example in the, the product design domain uh, as a good application to do right now uh, with the current technologies and processes. Yeah, so I think all these examples, what we um, have written right now here in the panel and also throughout the last um, uh, two days in the seminar, I think all of these are already examples which are quite advanced in the application of machine learning models. And so I, I really think that um, these advanced um, applications, this is like what what drives also management decisions to go into, into a, a specific direction and to really um, put some money um, into, into these topics. But um, yeah, as you, as you said, to be able to do that, there is need and upskilling um, the people. Maybe also you need to change some 
um, processes um, within your company. So how you handle data, also how data, especially also in, in, in the design process, how to hand over data from one department to another department, how to enable collaborative work in one project. And um, so I, I really think it's a lot of effort what needs to go um, into there, but this effort, so there, there will be a great impact on so many other levels as well, because as soon as you make the people in the company more um, data aware, so that people start to see the data which they are producing and which they are handling really as an asset, and they are kind of starting to take care of the data instead of maybe maybe being afraid of data. So, I mean, I think everyone has seen that, that um, yeah, I mean, drives get full. You don't know really what to do with it. You just want to get rid of the data. But moving from that part to really seeing this as an asset, taking care of the data, organize the data, spend some time in data management building up data mod uh, building up data models can be um, really advantage for the overall company because th also this already i mean this will not make your optimization or design processes 100 times faster as the application of the machine learning itself will do in the end but it will also enable people to make more data driven decisions and also to speed up internal processes. And yeah, so in the end, I think it will be advantage on so many levels. And yeah, so so I think may, maybe also just, just one last point on that, because so um, I know that a lot of people, they, they are afraid maybe, and then they think, oh, do I need to start coding or do I really need to dive deep into the data? And there, I think it's also just important to know that there's also commercial software out there which can support people in, um, for example, simulation data management. So, um, yeah, I think there's different ways to get started. All right. So my takeaway from uh, this first section is that um, the current usage, the benefits and challenges, they're all related to the, avail the available data and its, its uh, quality and the variety that's included. Uh, once you have that data, the application of the methods is actually less of a challenge. Still, there are some challenges, but less of a challenge. And I think that's a good tie-in to the question that I wanna ask to Alex, <clears throat> which is um, from your point of view, what are some challenges uh, of using um, data-driven methods in engineering applications? Thanks, Fatma, for the question. And uh, let me pick up on what Astrid just said. So still a big challenge is data availability. Where is the data located? If it's on a C drive or D drive of a computer in, in, in the company, it's not very useful for machine learning stuff. So it's that whole aspect of where is my data? How can I get that data? And that's just talking internally. If I talk externally, then we get the additional legal aspect that who owns the data? So do I actually have a right to see that data and can I use that data to make conclusions and so on? So in our case, who owns the data? Is it the airline? Is it the airframer? Is it us? So there need to be legal agreements in place before we can actually do all these fancy masks with machine learning and the conclusions. The other big challenge I see in the field is the data we typically get is, is a subsample of let's say the real data so it's typically highly correlated data it's along a flight so all these parameters it's a lot of parameters but they are correlated tightly to each other so they don't give me actually a lot of information for machine learning algorithm to get their t's in so that's why i think there is a big drive of combining that with physics informed models so that machine learning doesn't need to learn all the physics we already know so that's a big challenge, I think, still doing it. People say we have big data, but I don't think it's actually big data, even if we get terabytes of data every day, because it's highly, the sample is not a, a let's say, a uniform sample across everything. The data is highly correlated. So I, I don't have a lot of information in the data I'm getting, even if it's a lot of data. 
and finding then these nuggets is really difficult and that's why i think it's important that we fuse these things with the physics stuff which i think is a lot of things we talked about here we talked about the legal stuff the data availability i think those are the key things so and then like astrid said a little bit people are afraid to to get coding or actually the younger people are not afraid to get coding they like coding so but then what's the framework where you do the code coding is there a central system what's available there's multitudes of systems doing work there in offering machine learning stuff and analyzing data for you and doing these things so finding the right things is still difficult and which of the methods are really helping you finding the nuggets in the data giving all the challenges we i just highlighted Okay, over to you. Yeah, so that goes back to Remy's point of, you know, it's not the, the quantity of data, but quality of data. And all yep. these discussions have been going around um, the data that we collect from the field, from tests. But I want to go back to simulation data, and uh, which is one of the topics that I'm most interested in. So, uh, Maurice, I want to take uh, your thoughts on, you know, how to work with 3D geometric data, what, what do you think the, um, the current methodologies, how they're working, and uh, is there any promising methodology out there that, that you see? Um, yeah, well, so um, the, the route coming back to the our simulation processes is maybe um, enabled it to the point that um, I think geometry or, or pictures, this is actually where, where I found my way from the physics-inspired uh, finite element models uh, towards now believing that maybe machine learning is um, uh, transferring the same thing or disrupting the same thing. When I learned that, well, that you know, this vision or, or picture vision, uh, picture recognition, this world of machine learning, I think, is at least old enough that one could say, well, there, there they that they started and, and some of the those very powerful algorithms really, um, um, yeah, were born and uh, then when I when I look at where, where, where we see the challenge right now in, 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 in my company where geometry is uh, is so key uh, as you, you, you phrased the question so geometry could be the like the nice shiny geometry our designer you know the the art designers want to uh, want to sell our products so um, I mean this you know, sculpturing, uh, geometrical designing is uh, is very important. And there is also, by the way, there is innovation, a lot of innovation driving ourselves. So I think we, we can't even look a part of the innovation which comes from the young guys um, we, who are keen in coding and doing their things on their own. But then on, on, on the other end or on, on my end, we, geometry has to be very precise, you know, with the, when it comes then to manufacturing. And um, we're talking about very different levels of, uh, uh, of accuracy. And then right in the middle sits our classical CAE simulation chain. You know, we get some geometry, but even this geometry is not precise. And then we do what we want with physics with this geometry. And, and then I actually, I experienced that people are taking, you know, pictures out of our simulation data, where we're mentioning that sensor data is more available. Well, in, in, in my field, there's tons of simulation data available, very complex simulations, but the, the, the final result is maybe a picture or a movie or a, yeah, you know what I mean. And then people start, you know, picturing those results and training ML models on this, and um, yeah, then I then, then I grabbed on this um, on this process, and I I just wonder um, whether you know this understanding geometry from a pure computer um, machine learning aspect will overtake the way we we look at geometry, being it from you know from CAD geometry, from finite element geometries. Um, uh, where, which is still the base of the simulation model we, we put in on our, our HPC. So, um, yeah, actually, this is, uh, I think, where, where, where a very interesting uh, 
a field of research still lies on because there, you know, with geometry, you can produce as much data as you want. I mean, probably all these cloud um, uh, applications and, and, and point clouds and all those algorithms might ring a bell to, 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 the, to the audience. But I, I wonder, I, I still don't see the way to handle or to merge actually those two fields. And if we, if we don't manage to merge geometry uh, with ML and the way we handle geometry right now, which is also a, you know um, a very smart algorithms out there, then we don't need to talk about physics and um, the the challenge we face in the in our engineering problem. So yeah, to me that's also an open thing. But I. Uh, I'm kind of pushing those two worlds together in, in, in my applications. Uh, so in the opening uh, part of this panel, I said our goal is to classify the use cases, right? Into what can be done today, what can be done in the near future, and what is still a science fiction. Um, so it seems like um, sensor data, field data, there is mature tech methodologies, processes, and that can be easily used. Uh, partially because there is data and sometimes, you know, there are issues in the, the content of the data if it's very, you know, it has enough data diversity, but still the technologies are mature, the processes are a bit more mature. The second category of what's in the works or what's maybe coming in the near future um, could be what Moritz uh, is referring to working with 3D geometry uh, and being able to, um, you know, um, digest maybe historical data from the functionality of working directly with 3D geometry. And maybe what is uh, still a science fiction is uh, looking at a sketch and uh, predicting the, the fuel efficiency of a, of a vehicle. Um, all right, so with that, of course, along with challenges, there's a lot of people that works in this field. Uh, and so there's a lot of methods um, that's coming up from uh, you know, the big players um, that's uh, working on machine learning and, and AI. Um, so what are some of the trends that are applicable to engineering applications? And which ones do you think are promising? Astrid, would you like to take this question? Yes, sure. And I just think that you don't expect me to answer it like with uh, its pins for sure. <laughs> Because it's, I mean, it's 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 a it's a really broad question, right? But um, yeah, adding adding up to what uh, Moritz just said, so I I have to I have to say that for me personally, the um, possibility to predict spatial resolved flow field um, that's a game changer for me. So this is uh, definitely something where I also see um, a, a, just a new trend compared compared to um, the already well established also um, surrogate modeling with um, parametric um, design and the prediction of integral values, but yeah now moving towards these directions of uh, geometric deep learning and really being able to predict these um, yeah spatial fields I think that's a that's really massive um, game changer. Um, but yeah, I mean, apart from that, there are a lot of other techniques and approaches available. And um, so, I mean, of course, for me personally, I'm, I'm most interested in all the stuff which is applicable to, um, to CFD, so to the fluid mechanics um, side. And I think actually um, that also when we um, when we think of this um, Gartner AI maturity curve, there are a lot of trends and which ones will really um, then achieve uh, maturity so that they are applied in, in, in lots of commercial softwares and applied in, in a lot of companies and their day-to-day -day design work. Um, I think it's really hard to tell, but um, I also feel that um, a lot of these techniques, like for example, um, geometric deep learning pins and also um, reduced order modeling, I would not see them as um, uh, rivals, so to say, and one of these will emerge and uh, become the new best one. But I would actually rather see them as complementary techniques because it, it always also depends on the application and the question you are trying to solve. And I think there it's also um, going into the same direction what um, what Alexander was um, uh, mentioning before. And so, I mean, it's it's, exactly the same with finding the right data 
and then also finding the right method for what you are trying to achieve. And there it is, okay, am I more interested in which design um, will perform better compared to another design or am I interested in really um, high fidelity prediction of fields or do I want to predict turbulence patterns um, or yeah, finding turbulence closure, uh, closure models. So I think it's really, it's really hard. So the decision, which one is most promising for me, I think there you, everyone has to do some research, look out for new stuff. I personally can always recommend the YouTube videos from Stephen Brunton, who is in the um, showing the AI for fluid mechanics. And um, I think it, he's, he's really explaining this so great. And then check out which of these techniques might be applicable to your product and to your questions. Which use cases are out there? Are there already examples where this uh, could be applied successfully? And um, is this comparable to my case? So, yeah. I think that's, I agree with your assessment that none of these will be the answer and they'll all complement each other for different types of applications and different types of data. And that's partially why it may be a bit overwhelming to a practicing engineer, right? Because which ones to learn, which ones to follow, and hopefully these will be uh, more clear in the upcoming days. and. Um, and just like people develop expertise in different types of analysis, they'll also develop expertise in a in a um, in a focus area of of machine learning, and they wouldn't have to know maybe the others as much. Um, so going from CFD to structures, um, Brad, can you give us um, what your thoughts on or on emerging technologies for structural design, particularly this you know a process that closes the gap between design and manufacturing? Yeah, so one of the main areas that I have been following for the last 10 years is, is in structural design is topology optimization. So it has been around for a few decades now, but it basically promises that uh, structures can be designed by computers rather than humans. So if you give the right function, objective functions and constraints, you can obtain a structure that satisfies your, your, your engineering constraints. I think that's beautiful and there have been tons of classical methods but one thing that is emerging right now is uh, what i call neural optimization so basically it is the ability to use a neural network not in a data-driven manner not by looking at other topology optimized solutions but basically taking your given problem and using the back propagation uh, aspect of neural networks to do actually gradient descent um, so one, one interesting aspect of that is there's a lot of research that now supports neural networks um, from getting stuck in local minima. So you can actually really overcome some of the barriers of classical techniques by turning neural networks into basically an optimizer. So that has produced interesting research in the last two, three years. Um, and uh, we are a part of that small community that's working on that. And one of the interesting benefits of that approach is you can combine very different objective functions all at once. If you look at classical topology optimization, you're dealing with you know stress uh, constraint, mass minimization, compliance minimization under constraints, you know volume fraction constraints, and so forth. Those are very sterilized uh, objective functions. We are now working where we can co-optimize not only the topology but the minimization of the support structure, if you're gonna additively manufacture this, finding the best orientation in which you should print these objects in an additive manufacturing machine, all of those can be jointly optimized with these uh, interesting approaches. And the one thing that I'm you know, combining into manufacturing, one of the things I wanna highlight is, I think a real tension, a problem in, in legacy industries. So we're working with an aerospace company in which they have designs from 30 years ago and they cannot change the design, even though all the, the tooling, the machines to, to produce these are now obsolete, basically. So they have gone through tons of certification over the years when the design was first made, and you're now stuck with that static design. And you cannot change it, even though your manufacturing capabilities are evolving. So is there a new framework now in which the design itself is not the final IP. It's the problem specs that are the interesting design element, but the design, the realization of it can be subject to whatever new technologies that you have at hand, whatever new capabilities and supply chain issues that you might be facing given at that point. 
so the the thinking is a little hard and it it, it requires a cultural change in, in companies but it basically says if you're going to make an, an aircraft component on an aircraft carrier a replacement part you may not have all the cnc machines that you're you have on on the land side but you may have an additive manufacturing machine but you cannot make the classical design on an AM machine, just because that has not been certified, there are a lot of issues with you know going from a classical one to to an AM driven one. But can you actually redesign on the fly, knowing what materials are available to you, what supply chain issues there are, and what manufacturing capabilities you have? So we are now working on a system that can actually combine um, this this uh, fluid design where the engineering specs are given those are frozen but the design itself is a function of uh, the supply chain the the downstream uh, things that are available to you so i think I, I would like to see this this more holistic approach in design together with manufacturing the product realization actually go hand in hand and i think ml and ai can have a lot to offer in that regard okay that's an interesting topic uh, so it's more like modernizing and optimizing a, a design to fit into the requirements that's been there, except now the, the, uh, the manufacturing processes are different. You have more uh, flexibility in the materials and you have different parts suppliers. So how do you optimize for modern for this modern condition exactly even for your suppliers you can do that you know one supplier one day let's say has all the additive machines another one has all the subtractive but that subtractive supplier let's say goes out of business and you're a big aerospace company you have to switch some of your design to additive can you how fast can you do that will it take another 10 years of development or can you actually do this massively massive data generation in an offline setting and be able to do you know, real-time picking and, and guiding of your manufacturing capabilities, which will inform the design choice itself. So it's a, it's, to me, it's a fascinating um, problem, first of all, and I think the solutions are, I, I can see the, 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 the vision at the end of the tunnel. Interesting, thank you so much. Um, so let's go to, uh, from, a, from um, domain applications to processes. Moritz, you brought up a topic uh, which I hadn't heard before or a term, Python pencil. Uh, so what does that mean? What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, actually, I, I wonder whether we should skip now this visionary discussion we just had from, from Burak. And I, I, I love this, you know, connection of the good old topology optimization to uh, towards actually discussing now the optimization methods. So I also wonder whether machine learning sometimes turns into machine optimization. I wonder uh, wh wh where the definitions come from and who, who's going to be first in, in, in disrupting the, the wording on this. Um, however, now, Maybe in 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 the industry we we live on, I I brought up this this wording of of Python pencil um, because we we do have heritage, but we don't have that strong heritage as in the aerospace industry, which you we were referring your uh, your ideas, Barak. Um, so changing personnel quicker than actually maybe changing the product because well our cars still do actually drive with four wheels. Um, brought up this question to to my side because I I, I mean I see the, the the young guys coming up with a lot of skills. They don't have the heritage in whatever simulation modeling techniques I learned the hard way in my mechanical engineering, but they they know how to work with their tools and in the end that's Python. And um, so what we see in, in our company, which is large enough to have enough, you know, battlefields of software pipelines, you know, commercial softwares asking for skills here and there, or even building, you know, an environment of, of, of skills towards certain software pipelines in the, in the CAD and CAE world. Um, I, I wonder whether you all maybe agree that in the end, the, the young guys, they, they use their coding style, maybe be it Python as a pencil, and you can throw whatever problem you have on, on, on those guys. And now, right, if it's then, if you have then a requirement set and, and uh, pose a structural optimization problem to 
such a young uh, young person being very very eager and 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 capable in python he might come up with topology optimization he might come up with a benzo 99 code answer but he he would just form his pipeline um where in the end it's machine learning based we would probably call it machine learning based but it's not that strict way of also what, what Astrid said, where we say, oh, well, is it this algorithm? Is it that algorithm? Um, where is the data from? And is it an outlier or not? Um, in, it'll be sort of a pencil where nowadays we use pencils doing artwork or, or you know, engineering sketches. So I think this, this is what we're facing in future anyways. And therefore I wouldn't, focus anymore on this you know the battlefield as we mentioned or even providing spe specific software tool change or things like that i would i would see it more flexible in the way of um teach the the young to, to bring in their pencils and then let the the creativity rule Interesting. It is true that the younger generation is not using the literal pencil anymore. And now, so I can relate to your idea of a uh, Python pencil much more. And yeah, I can, I can see how that's happening as well. Um, so one of the questions that comes as soon as we talk about using um, data science and engineering is how that compares with what we do now with simulations or with signal processing on the test data. And um you know is it going to replace the simulations in typical signal processing is it going to complement it and one of the things that's um of interest in 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 that in that line of questioning is is it ever going to be able to emulate experts or is it going to be just a simple you know uh analytical equation or a model for simple kpis so uh moritz and brock you both brought up um, topics related to this, you know, how does it help for uh, user preference in design or how does it help with emulating experts? So, Moritz, can we continue uh, with you maybe um, telling your thoughts on that topic? Yeah, I, uh, unfortunately, I actually, I believe that on, on the second way, maybe because I'm, I'm working in the expert field right now. Um, I don't, I mean, we're mentioning data in maybe aerospace with all the outlaws, with all the complex physics being in that product development for maybe a hundred years now, um, where it is expertise and probably all of you, I mean, a lot of us had mechanical engineering as a background. So you, you we know our simulation codes, we know how to code, we, we maybe know where the data is stored. We, we, we do know our logics uh, on how to handle this data and this, does help a lot in bringing uh, those um, ML called algorithms into living. So therefore, I actually believe that we're kind of disrupting ourselves, which is, I mean, no worries on this. Um, on the other hand, maybe, yeah, you know, AI and, and the, the, this, as I said, the, this vision recognition uh, field is so large that we maybe sometimes bring maybe what our, our car data into some repository and then uh, people are working on this. I mean, they are maybe in, in, in more emerging fields like biomechanics, biomechanical data or, or medicine data, maybe like coming out of the pandemic that is helping the society even more. Uh, and then this is not expert field anymore. This is just the provision of huge data sets and could, could also be success stories. I don't know actually, but uh, I, I believe I still believe that we can even uh, disrupt our expertise or our experts with those methods because they're just very powerful. All right, Brock has also touched upon this point. Um, so, what are your thoughts? And you mentioned, for example, aesthetics as one criteria that uh, you know ML ML models um, could capture. And of course, the follow up question to that is always. What about human creativity? Does that mean, you know, where does the human creativity influence these decisions? Right. And yeah, we have been pondering that for a while. We don't have an answer, but I think um, if anything, uh, talking to different designers and, and groups of people who are not well versed in, in computation, machine learning at all, I think we can hear what they're calling for. And one thing that I see is missing big time 
in especially product design, aesthetic industrial product design um, circles is being able to learn from humans. So I, I think whenever the objectives are very scientific, engineering oriented, you know, it's very easy to come up with objective functions that could be minimized by optimizers. But how do you capture human aesthetic views and their essence and not only creative people, but the consumers themselves? I think that this is a huge, huge opportunity where ML can come in. And the big difficulty that I see here is twofolds. One is when you look at a repository of a company, let's, let's say BMW, because Moritz is, is from there, but they will have decades of cars that they have built, right? So a lot of human also touch has gone into those on top of all the engineering issues. So there's a lot of tacit human information in those designs. How can you actually take a pool of geometries and kind of reverse engineer what the humans wanted? And these can be multiple. This can be about safety. This can be about aesthetics this can be about just preferences in general human you know body shape for instance is there a way to reverse engineer this and map it to the geometry that you're seeing so how do you take two cars millions of data points millions of elements on each not there's no one-to-one -one correspondence here's your data how do you learn from this i mean these are very very i think difficult problems but also very exciting the other thing that i want to combine is um you know, we, we have we have done a little bit of work in this th that I can see where it can go is learning from large scales like Amazon Turk type of studies where you present masses of people with geometries and pairwise comparisons of products, their preferences. You know, I like this. I don't like this. This looks faster. This looks slower in the case of automotive industry, for instance, be able to discern based on humans look, looking at you know, product images, how do they talk about them and how do they characterize that and take that human level language and map it to product geometry. So imagine now a CAD tool where a human is not playing with control points, uh, but they're actually having some semantic sliders where you can say, here's a product, I want it to look more aggressive. So how do you decipher the notion of aggressiveness? And I think this can be done through by looking at humans, understanding how they respond to products in the past, machine learn that, and then bring it to your future design. I think there's fascinating opportunities here, which I think is is not has not been as 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 attractive to the ML community as it could have been. I think one application of a similar thing is correct. If, for example, for operations, if you collected how your expert has been making decisions, um, training an ML model and deploying it for the junior engineers um, is is on, along the similar lines of capturing an expert's thinking process in an ML model. Um, so I want to conclude this section, which is comparison to what we have now with Astrid. So what do you think, you know, is our simulations going away? Uh, how do you see the transition or the, the complementary work for data-driven models with physics-driven models? So, I mean, of course, I don't want uh, CFD to go away because, uh, yeah, I just love it very much. But um, I actually do see this um, in a similar way as for the domain experts as well, because as you as you just mentioned, I think this training of assistants like a mini me who will just do the repetitive work. So that frees up some time for me to take care of the real interesting stuff. I think the same would also apply to simulation. And I can just envision that we will reach a similar state what we have today with simulation versus experiments. So um, that simulation has taken over a lot of um, the volume of experiments you need to run. And, but you still need the experiments to validate the simulation. And I can just imagine that we will reach a similar state um, with simulation and machine learning models so that we still need the simulation to validate our models, but maybe we do not need to run 2000 simulations for, do, for optimizing a part, but rather doing, um, doing the optimization itself with a model, um, but from time to time running simulations for validating or running simulations really for um, high fidelity um, problems, stuff like this. 
So um, yeah, I think it's 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 going it's it's moving into the same direction. So I think maybe also, sorry, maybe the challenge is not even running two thousand simulations, but picking the right twenty simulations that one yeah. can afford to run out of the two thousand that one would like to run. Yeah. Um, so. Thanks, Astrid. Um, So the last section is about, okay, for those who are uh, encouraged with what they heard and would like to either um, see how they can start as an engineer in uh, using data science or as a company uh, looking, getting ready to use data science. Um, Remy, can you talk to the data aspects of it? And there was one question that I, I wanted to ask you um, in talking about data, you know, do we see, uh, merging of different data sources in the near future, you know, can one use simulation data with the data from field um, as mm -hmm. they have their different characteristics, their different issues? Um, what do you think on this? Mm -hmm. Well, before I jump on on that answer, I want to just chime in on the uh, sharpening the how to get started and sharpening your <laughs> Python pencil. Um, uh, <laughs> I, I think as engineers, uh, you know, if you're starting in the field of, of AI and machine learning, and deep learning, don't go to the most complex, you know, 3D convolution neural networks or generative adversarial networks or, you know, more sophisticated ma machine learning stuff on day one. Start with the basic stuff. <laughs> and make your way up. And that does two things, by the way, even experts after 10 years, I still start with a very basic uh, um, you know, modeling aspects to this and then to get a baseline. Right, and it's not going to be good. The baseline is not going to be good, but it's going to be your baseline. Then you're going to know as you improve that actually you're making progress and where to stop on the on the food chain. And and that relates back to the data, uh, Fatima, uh, Fatima uh, in terms of the um, uh, the usage of the data and the combination of data. Uh, we 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 look at simulation data, and and often when we talk to people, they they ask me first question, you know, how many how many simulation uh, uh, you know, runs do I need to have enough data to 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 you know apply machine learning, and it's kind of a a, a, a funny uh, way to start the conversation because the the conversation should be flipped of, okay, what's the business reason, the use case that you're trying to you know tackle using machine learning. And that might dictate how many simulation runs you need, because that will kind of inform us to where you need to get to. So I, I know it's not the straight answer that everyone would want, and and I I can pr provide some you know very s uh, specific uh, number of models. We we always start with a hundred simulations because that's the minimum you're going to ever get away with, <laughs> even for a basic you know uh, um, whatever regression model that you're going to run. Right? If you don't have in the hundreds. Don't even try and think of applying machine learning. That's just ridiculous. There's not enough data, and I, in, in normal circumstances, there's one exception, which you know, in the future of you know physics-informed neural networks and and 3D convolution neural networks, where I, I think at some at some point we won't need as much. But in any case, um, it, it, right now that's kind of the starting point, and then you move depending on the number of of parameters that you need to uh, to change and modify in your model. That will also dictate how many simulations runs you need you need the variance where we talk about the the quantity of data quantity of data is required because you need variance and enough things to vary uh, i i go back to this expression of you're probably um uh, data rich but your wisdom poor because you don't have much variance you know you have the same models that you've nudged you know quality it's kind of you know if you look at the quality you're going to nudge your parameters just a little bit to increase the quality a little bit and then a little bit and a little bit and you think you have a lot of data but in the end you went from you know 0.1 to 0.13 <laughs> so the variance is not enough in you know in in that kind of a data set so so people need to learn that you need you know uh, deliberate variance in the data that you you apply to so that the machine learning algorithms can learn something from it so if you're starting with machine learning a couple of things is you know don't, don't think you're data rich if uh, if you or wisdom rich if if you only have a little bit of variance in in the uh, you know parameters you've tried and, and ran simulations for uh, and below 100, I, I don't think you you should look at machine learning as an answer to the problem, the business use case you're trying to solve. Uh, that that probably is not the right um, hammer for 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 the job, so to speak. 
Um, so I hope that informs a little bit, you know, um, the, the the scope of things in terms of hybrid data sets. Though, one thing where you do get a lot of good uh, solid data, if you filter out the outliers and the bad data, is from real time telemetry. And again, it can can come from test, right? Test specimen that we've all as engineers loved because it's a very nicely uh, defined environment and ecosystem where we know uh, it's a controlled condition, but um, what engineers have uh, need to learn is to appreciate the amount of operations time series data that are out there so you know for astrid in terms of cfd you know we have tons of pressure sensors and edge device collecting temperatures humidity and and pressure in in various conditions and that is really rich in terms of in, uh, the variance that you get now the flip side of this is it's not controlled so you, you don't necessarily know all the external <laughs> boundaries that generated that data but at least you got a lot of variance in the data so anyway you have to learn to to harness the the the, the right uh data in the, in the toolkit that you use but sharpening your python scripting um <laughs> capabilities are definitely a, a, a nice way to start <laughs> Thanks, Jeremy. Um, so, Alex, uh, we've been keeping you quiet for a while. What are your some uh, What are your suggestions for people who want to start in this field, or for companies that want to start in this field? Yeah. So let, let me pick up the, the the training aspect probably first, and and it's a little bit like Remy said, and uh, the people in front of me. And like we said earlier, you need a solid foundation. And I think you need a real solid foundation in statistics because that's kind of the background behind everything. It's like Remy just said, if the variance is not in your data, your machine learning will not find it. It's not there. So you need to make sure that your sample is okay, that you, you actually cover what you want to cover, that the parameter space is okay. And that's all just basic good statistical knowledge. We know that kind of stuff, how to build up samples, how to analyze samples. Nothing to do with machine learning, but you need a good solid foundation. The other thing I think you need is domain knowledge because you need to assess is actually the phenomenon I'm looking into available in my data or how do I get that data so that I can observe that phenomenon I want to observe and then I can use machine learning to go on. And that's really for companies. And currently there is all that hype about applying machine learning to everything kind of. I have some data stream coming in or I have some data collected, let's apply machine learning. An example I had at some point when somebody tried to basically extract the, uh, extract the behavior with between three variables and the data he had were nearly 100% correlated. So between these three variables, so there is no way that any machine learning algorithm or any other algorithm can decipher then that behavior. So just look at that and make sure that your data you have contains the information you are looking for before you apply it. And don't just throw machine learning on everything you, you want now because you think it's a, it's a nice thing to do or a fancy thing to do. Really look what's the business proposition like Remy said earlier. What's the problem I want to solve and can help machine learning, can we help to solve that problem? It's a little bit like everybody wants to do simulations, but sometimes it's even easier to just do an experiment. <laughs> it's easier to find the answer I need in an experiment than in hundreds of simulations sometimes. So look at the business problem you want to solve and then pick the right method, being an experiment, being a simulation, being machine learning and then use that to guide where you go. Back to you, Fatma. All right, thanks, Alex. So um, I think it would be fair if I could summarize this last uh, discussion as start with your business objective uh, and, and then go chase your data or augment your data if you have to. And then you can, uh, once you have these two, the methods will be easier to, uh, to pinpoint. All right, so we're at the stage where we start taking questions from uh, from the Q&A box. So let me start. Um, I saw one uh, question at, earlier, which was, um, do you see data sharing and distributed data spaces as a solution? Um, so I'm going to 
I know that um, federated machine learning um, it aims to do this, and I know it's uh, applied in um, other domains like hospitals, and um, so they can all benefit from each other's data. But I'm having difficult time to see how that can be done for product design. Um, so I want to see if anyone wants to chime in. Do you see data sharing between companies? I can answer to one at least case that I know worked was for you know uh, subsets of of engineering uh, so simple things like pumps and and systems the subsystems that are part of a larger system where the data from the OEM uh, maker uh, can and should be shared if they you know if you can come up with an agreement because then you get a lot of of really good information on the operational usage and not just the specs <laughs> um, where you can really use that data to inform the bigger system as to how it's going to really behave in specific let's call it con corner conditions right not just the normal like you know uh, conditions but outside the realm a little bit of, of where you think that you might have some failure scenarios uh, occurring so that i've seen and and we've leveraged from oem of smaller components into a bigger system model uh that 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 was enabled and and happened fairly seamlessly because both then the OEM maker and the system uh, engineering group benefit from each other. And you can then feed back on findings that you have from the system. So as long as there's a two-way street and not just, oh, I'm going to give you my data and you know I, I stay hands off, that, that never really pans out very well because there's no return on the business value. And to me, that's really where those, those can be made to be successful. And Alex had mentioned earlier about the legality of uh, yeah. even using data that you have access to, right? Can you can you use that data? Can you use the models that you trained from that data? And it's really like Remy said, it's all down to the business value. There needs to be value for both. Otherwise, they will not agree to share the data. And then you cannot federate the data analysis. So. All right. Um, so another question is, what can we do to improve ML AI know-how among the domain experts and managers? Any managers that wants to take that question? Sure. That's probably the reason why we have the engineering data science man, man, working group at NAFAMS and why we are interested in these are kind of the things we want to develop, I think, as part of NAFEMS and the, that working group. What are the key things? And I think initially it, it just needs to be a, a simple flyer or something. What is that? Everybody talks about machine learning, but probably most of the people don't know what it actually is. So I think clarifying what it is, what it can do, where's the business value for it would really help along line, that lines. I think that's what you wanted to do with the group so that would be a little bit of marketing on our site but uh i think the answer to that question is go to nafam's website to community technical groups find engineering data science page and uh join the community and you'll be notified of panels like this where we discuss um current uh usage of machine learning and what's what's coming in the near future as well as applications um all right so um another question here is um does the models usually work best with uh finite element model simulated data or sensor data so remy as the designated data person i'm gonna uh pass this question to you well, so I mean, so there's two use cases here, and and uh, so it, the answer depends on on what you want to do with the data, right? So if 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 you want to build um, uh, models that will run live in real time alongside the real time telemetry that you're collecting, and you want to reduce it or use it, then clearly the real time telemetry data is the data that you should be focusing on now. You know the the challenge with that data again is all the outliers and all the the you know we we have this uh, saying here um, that uh, you know assume your data is dirty until proven clean and reliably clean through data pipelines because otherwise garbage in garbage out 
it's real. Like this is a real problem in, in operations. You're going to see all sorts of things happening for all sorts of good valid reasons that happen in production. The thing gets shut down for two minutes. They go on a, you know, a break, they come back or the operations, the, the, whatever, there's a, a pocket of air that gets the aircraft to go down all of a sudden, all of these kinds of anomalies and outliers will be in the data. So you have to be careful on how you use that data. So that's the flip side of using simulation data is a lot more stable and control. You control the you know the variance and the input that you really are after. So if you're after a very accurate digital twin type of live twin model that will run alongside your telemetry, then basing it initially on just a sim pure simulation data set is is the smart thing to do. So depending on you know where you are in the spectrum and how much you know compute you have on on the simulation side, you would err in one way or the other. The other aspect of this is explainability versus interpretability of the result that you're getting, right? So physics-based type of, of model and simulation model will typically lead or yield explainability. You'll have a cause and effect relationship within the data that the model, the simulation, and the physics behind it can explain. On the data-driven kind of approaches, typically what all you can hope for is interpretability of the, the outcome. And in those cases, there's a probability. So back to Alex's comment, uh, understanding the statistics very well, you know, you, you won't be able to make a cause and effect relationship. You're going to be able to say there's a correlation. And in 92% of the cases, there was a cause and effect re relating to what the failure was based on that. But it's always a percentage. So those kinds of explainability versus inter interpretation, uh, data-driven versus physics approach in terms of the data is very important for you to understand before you launch into is it one or the other it, it depends on 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 what you want to achieve and there's a really good follow-up question which is explain what approaches are used to assess the credibility of huge volumes of data oh my goodness that's in the uh, unsupervised kind of <laughs> <laughs> realm of things that I, I, I adore and hate with a passion at the same time because they're really challenging problems. Uh, I don't know if other want to chime in here, Moritz. You, <laughs> uh, we can't answer this. I mean, that's the like put the bring this question on every year and then let's see. It's yeah. <laughs> So we'll ask this in the next panel as well and see if there's any progress in this field. I think well in terms of real data whether it's credible or not i think you have to say it's it is credible meaning if the question is whether you're 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 skeptical about the accuracy of the data is it tainted data there was a loss of stream of data you know if that's the question i think um you know simple analysis may reveal if if such you know very odd patterns are there but otherwise real world data will be very messy um, for instance, in the in the space of supply chain optimization, you know, you might be working with uh, an enterprise level software that's collecting information, real time information from many different suppliers, vendors and supermarkets where products are being sold. And then you're looking at all these patterns to predict what's going to happen next week, not six months down the road, which is actually much easier, but in a short term prediction. That data is going to be massive and is massive, and it is very, very difficult to identify meaningful patterns. So one thing that we did, you know, going back to what Remy was saying, yes, yeah, some sort of an unsupervised learning to understand, you know, are there different pockets of clusters or pattern behavior? And in this massive set of data, there might actually be these subsections in which there is more of an organ organized structure kind of pattern rather than across the entire data. And uh, we have seen that if we actually make our data sets smaller, we get much better accuracy versus trying to push the entire set of data into one ML algorithm. So uh, I think in terms of credibility, this type of a pre-analysis on your data in terms of an unsupervised learning can be one, one, one key solution. Yeah, that's uh, actually a, a sound practice to do some clustering or anomalies action type of um, study on big data. Um, so Astrid, I want to um, um, send this question your way. Um, if domain expertise is first necessary to leverage ML AI, does that mean this field is inaccessible to new graduates until they have 10, 20 plus years of experience? 
If not, in what ways can companies utilize new graduates that are trained with the latest and greatest, looking at things with fresh eyes and eager to contribute to cutting edge? Oh my God, that that was a long question. I um, <laughs> so, so, so maybe to summarize, what is your suggestion to new graduates who doesn't quite have the domain expertise but has this additional skill set that um, older generation doesn't have? Yeah, so so I I actually I really think that um, that this is um, great opportunities also like to pair up and um, like really to to support each other there and also like to spark the interest in the other one for the respective domain. So I think that um, also like having having a really experienced um, um, domain expert who may not be so proficient in coding or whatsoever. So I mean, he's he's an experienced engineer, and coding is not rocket science. So he's he's able to to keep it up. So um, I think it is it's just important that um, yeah that people are open open minded for the other. Um, 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 field of expertise as well and are just willing to to help each other and then there should not be a problem but of course I really um, so what I what I do see actually that it is in in the one direction it it, it might be easier so that you have some um, domain expertise in in one field of engineering and then add some data science um, spice onto that um, so I think this might be easier than the other way around. So um, coming from the pure data science world, maybe from, I don't know, some B2B um, analysis um, part and then trying really to dive deep into um, engineering topics. So I think this is definitely harder. See Remy uh, sending thumbs up. Yeah, I think we agreed. So I would like to start wrapping up the panel. There's still some questions. Um, so, but there's one comment that I think uh, I can take on as a task as uh, for the NAFEM's Engineering Data Science Working Group. Um, that is, many challenges have been noted by the panel. It will be nice to see on a maturity curve, uh, share the various aspects of data science are today. Is this a practical test, task? Um, and uh, yeah, your no, uh, comment uh, suggestion is noted. I think that would be an interesting thing uh, for the engineering data science working group members to do, um, to sort of put these three buckets into a curve of what can be done today in the near future and um, and still some has some space to go. All right, with that, I would like to wrap up the, the panel. Um, thank you so much to all panelists for sharing your experiences with us today and everyone attending the panel and asking questions. Um, and so as you can see, this is a fast growing, exciting field and, and it will for sure be changing how we design, manufacture and operate products for better. And once again, before I uh, conclude the event, please go to NAFAM's website, community, uh, working groups or technical groups um, and engineering data science group to be a member of our community. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.